Greetings and welcome to the Hourlings Podcast Project. My name is Martin Wilsey. Welcome to another episode. Tonight we're going to be talking about writing characters that are not human. But before we get started, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves and tell us a fun fact. Jeffrey, you go first. Okay, thank you, thank you. You know, one thing that I will say is that when I started writing, it was for a show about a Time Lord. He's not human. And I love that idea. So, of course, I love creating characters that are not human because I started my writing with Doctor Who and fiction. David. All right. My name is David Keener. I write science fiction and fantasy. And... There was once upon a time, a, a time period where I figured becoming an author just wasn't something that was possible. And so I got involved in gaming, specifically role-playing games. And I ran these elaborate um, games for, uh, for my friends uh, that were really like interactive novels. I have an entire box of folders of plot lines from those games that are basically fully plotted out novels with all kinds of plot twists. And I'm talking 25 or 30 mm. novels. I've started actually taking some of that material and turning them into stories. So we expect to see more from that uh, mysterious box. Shay. Hey, I'm S.C. McGowey. I write YA and other things. Uh, my fun fact is that I have become uh, even nerdy, nerdier than I was before, which I did not think was possible, uh, because I started to collect Magic the Gathering cards, um, and I love to look at the artwork on the cards. Uh, I find them really inspiring to my imagination about things to write, my next uh, fantasy or sci-fi uh, novel, and speaking of non-human characters, my favorite cards are the ones that uh, turn, you know, weird weird animals into humanoid warriors or kings or combine animals like um, there was a dinosaur cat in one card. I was like, wow, that's a weird combination. Uh, so just having all sorts of humanoid uh, creatures has really inspired me. I thought it'd be good for this, uh, this topic to share that fun fact. Erica? Erica, you're muted. <laughs> Oh, sorry, guys. I didn't realize. <laughs> I'm surprised that hasn't happened to us before now. Yeah. You're the first. Um, I'm Erica Root, and I write science fiction. And my uh, interesting fact, I guess, going off of what she said about Magic the Gathering cards, I have, uh, I still have like all of my Pokemon cards from when I was a kid, including all of like my fancy holographic ones that I just like treasured and loved, even though I never, I think I played the game like once. So, right. That one's making me feel old. <laughs> yeah, you guys talking about collecting stuff uh, made me change up my uh, fun fact. I collect toy robots from the movies. Ooh. I had I have a, a metric ton of these, everything from C3PO and R2D2 to the Terminator to IG88 to uh, you know the Cylons and uh, you know the robot from uh, um, Metropolis. It's uh, quite a fun collection. So now my wife is starting to buy them for me. I just got a really sweet Wally. It was great. <laughs> So today, our topic is writing characters that are non-human. Um, I'm lucky enough to actually have um, written a character in a couple novels that isn't human. It was a, a cat, specifically a genetically engineered cat that they made to uh, be smarter um, without realizing what an asshole cats are. And it has turned out to actually be a really fun character to, uh, to develop for the couple novels that uh, he's been in so far. So uh, go ahead, who, who, who wants to jump in? Let's just uh, free for all it. Well, I will say this, one of my favorite characters that is going to hopefully be in one of the future novels in Project Chronosphere's universe is the character of, yeah, I know, but it's Cthulhu. It's not the real Cthulhu, don't worry, I'm not stealing from H.P. Lovecraft, it's just that he's an alien that lives, uh, that comes from the planet Jupiter. He's not actually, his species is not from Jupiter, but they came from, uh, you know, and they colonized Jupiter. And they like Jupiter because it's a big gas, 
giant and they live in gas giant worlds. He is like an octopus. He has his legs and he just breathes in that. So they have an ambassador on earth and he lives in the ocean because the ocean emulates the, the environment of Jupiter. And he says, well, we came to earth and I feared I needed a name that you guys could pronounce because my name is and so I will call myself Cthulhu. And my number two over there, he's Squidward. I think that we should define non-human characters. I, I, I can, can think of three categories. You know, maybe you can think of more. The first one would be um, a different species. So either an alien or even an animal that is sentient. Uh, so that'd be one category. Another category would be AI. So robots, um, even like consciousness, like uh, my favorite movie is Her, uh, with mm. a romance between a, a man and an AI. Uh, and then the third one would be inanimate objects, which I think is the, the least common one. But I have written a short story and the, the POV protagonist was a confessional at a church. Mm. And uh, you can imagine what that conf confessional knew about people. Uh, and so that was an interesting way that I wrote uh, a non-human character. So those would be my three categories for what non-human characters are. Did I cover all the categories, do you think? Um, are we counting things like vampires and werewolves as different, like, like alien-ish species? I would count that, I mean, I, I would almost put that as a, a person with a disease. Um, you know, a, a, well, a, a, a fantasy. Yeah, they're kind of humanoid. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I, just curious. Yeah, I would uh, cross categorize that. So we can roll it any way we want. Yeah. Uh, like, for instance, I'd write a vampire just like a human, except with a few extra, you know, habits. Mm. Likes blood. There you go. <laughs> uh, although I, I think the vampire stories are stronger when, when they have their own background and their own history and their own religion that has some of the same touch points as Christianity, but from their viewpoint. Um, and, and they think of themselves as a separate species that preys on humans as opposed to actually being humans. And if you're talking yeah, about werewolves and vampires, then what about dwarves and elves, you know? Yeah, I think the point you just brought up, David, is that whatever character you're writing, whether it's human or non-human, whether it is a robot or, a, you know, uh, a cat, in outer space, um, it's important to actually have them be fully three-dimensional. You know, to have them have a personality, have them have a history, have them have um, all the dimensionality that um, that an actual person, a character, would have. I think that there's a big failure a lot of times in science fiction, in particular, when they'll have you know, those gray aliens that have absolutely no personality whatsoever right. or, you know, an agency or whatever. Um, that's a big mistake that um, writing non-human characters can make. Don't make them two-dimensional. It's, it's worse with a non-human character, especially if you fall in the cliches. I think oh, aliens are more than just humans in rubber suits or yeah. Hollywood makeup. They're, they're different. Perhaps I would also be I'd also be careful with using um, non-human characters as metaphors for race. Uh, mm -hmm. I see that happening sometimes in sci-fi sci and fantasy. And I think one example is Star Wars. Uh, you always see how the Empire people are all the same. You know, they're all white humans, and then you have the the Alliance side being a diversity of different alien species. Um, I was never a fan of that metaphor that, that Star Wars was trying to make. Uh, it was definitely a racially uh, undertone metaphor. But I, I would agree with Marty to not try to pigeonhole or use your non-human characters as a, you know, a, a theme setter for your book and make them three-dimensional. Oh, yeah. Well, I think the biggest issue is we are humans. We have emotions. And our range of emotions are complicated. But what emotions do aliens have? Do they have the same emotions? Do they have different emotions? Do they have an emotion that would be like imagining what the fifth dimension polytopes look like? You know, we're humans. We live in the three-dimensional universe. But a 
five dimensional being would say, oh yeah, I know exactly what a cross polytope looks like in five dimensions. You guys are weird. You can't imagine that. And so what, you know, coming up with those ideas, what do they see differently that we as humans would see? It's one of the biggest and also hardest things to do. But when you get it right, you get it right. And I'll just add that Doctor Who, that's a perfect example of sometimes he's very human, but sometimes he just does things that are a little bit weird. And it's because he's not human. He's Gallifreyan or she's Gallifreyan um, from, you know, maybe she's not even Gallifreyan if you know a little bit about Doctor Who, but just saying. Well, I, I think a lot of uh, the nature of any alien or or even a, even a separate species that's been raised to intelligence, whether it's an intelligent dog or an intelligent cat, um, they're going to come to to that with a, with a different viewpoint. Um, for example, uh, I remember growing up, I, I looked out my back window one time and there was uh, one of my cats was being chased and, and harassed by a blue jay. What the blue jay didn't realize was that this was a big 20 pound cat. Uh, and like something in slow motion out of one of those wild animal kingdom uh, movies, um, that cat jumped almost eight feet up into the air it looked like something in slow motion and took that uh, that blue jay out of the out of the air and happily played with him as a toy for the next half hour mm -hmm. which is something we would not do but it was perfectly normal and natural for for a cat and you would never get a cat to understand why that would be cruel and unusual behavior because they won it's mm -hmm. their toy mm -hmm. right and if you can capture that in the story you can make that cat seem both intelligent and and real as a cat. I would also say that there is a big difference between non-human characters that are simply um, masks for telling a totally human story and uh, non-human characters interacting with human characters in a story. And to color that statement, I'll, I'll, I'll point to The Lion King which is, you know, all uh, animal, non-human characters, uh, you know, lions mostly, uh, is basically just Macbeth uh, with lion characters acting and talking and interacting totally human, but with, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of playful jumping after prey in the savannah or whatever, uh, you know, a couple, couple of playful details. But mostly it's really just a human story and let's just put animal faces on it. Um, so that, that's a big difference from trying to create an ecosystem in your story that includes both human and non-human characters. And you just gave Another. me a perfect setup because the one I wanted to talk about was C.J. Cherry's story, Pride of Chinur, uh, which is a, a first contact situation from the standpoint, from the viewpoint of the aliens. Mm -hmm. Aliens in this case are actually very similar to lions, uh, lions in the wild, um, with a culture of, um, uh, with a patriarchal culture based on uh, combat between patriarchs and things of that nature. And so the crew that first encounters a, a single human that has been captured and, and is being paraded around the, the, the alien space by their enemies, um, in addition to dealing with the human and the, the, the conflicts that come, come from possessing a human that everybody else wants, they also have to deal with the fact that their culture um, is organized along the, 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 the lines of lion packs, again, and just by virtue of having this, this human in their possession, um, they may actually um, lose uh, basically their clan holdings and, and everything. And it's it's very masterfully well done. It was a Hugh nominated uh, novel when it, when it came out. And it's really taking the idea of a lion as, as an alien species mm. and, and saying, well, how would that really work? What, happened, what would happen if lions actually developed civilization and intelligence and, and everything? What would their society look like and how would it be different from people? Much like Planet of the Apes, right? Planet of the Apes, I kind of disagree with because I, I feel like that's just humans in fur suits. Yeah. Well, I guess it depends on which, which version. <laughs> well, it does. It also depends a bit on, uh, you know, if you're going to do something that's called furry uh, novel, you know, furries are humans 
brains in animals. They act just like humans. They do things just like humans. But they back to the Lion King example. To yeah, exactly. But they may add, which is within the furry uh, community, okay, to say, well, this is a rat, so it does have very intelligent, very good intelligence and good seeing and good uh, hearing and all that, uh, accentuating their differences. Of course, the uh, famous is Zootopia. If you've seen the new movie, ah, oh, great movie, yeah. That's that's the typical furry concept. Mm. They're humans. They're just living with certain augmentations that yeah. are in their lives. Totally. Actually, another one I like is the movie Up from Pixar. Mm. Um, they have a, a dog in it that has a magical collar, basically, that lets him speak. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the dog is clearly acting intelligent, but if you listen to him, he is, he is clearly and totally acting like you'd expect a dog uh, to act from him. That was really good. It was really good. Well, and it's, just, it's well done and it's absolutely hysterical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pixar is a great example of a non-human character, I think. Uh, I would say with the exception of Up, most of Pixar's protagonists are non-human, from Monsters, Inc., which mm -hmm. were, you know, monsters, um, to Toy Story, which is an inanimate object. But I do agree that that probably would fall more under what Jeffrey was talking about, where Pixar really just uses human stories and has uh, interesting and friendly non-human protagonists. Would you agree, Jeffrey? Does that sound oh, right? I agree. But then you go to the Star Trek, the old Star Trek. All the people in Star Trek that were quote unquote aliens, they were just humans with funny ears sometimes. I mean, well, so I, I wanted to kind of talk about Star Trek a little bit because so Star Trek, it's sort of it's supposed to be a play on um, like the the fantasy races, like the Vulcans are, are elves or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this idea of taking an element of humanity and like cranking that element up to, you know, close to maximum and sort of exploring like, okay, what does it look like if you, you know, max logic, you know, mm -hmm. or um, being emotionless. Um, and then the Klingons, right? They're extremely angry and warlike. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in, so in Voyager, there's this really interesting character, um, Bolana Torres, who's like mm -hmm. part, uh, um, part, oh, cool. Klingon, like forgetting, like yeah, part Klingon and part human, and um, just sort of seeing the the different like aspects of, of that coming together, um, and sort of the struggles that she has. So I I think that that sort of humans in rubber suits, in a way, um, with with slightly exaggerated or very exaggerated characteristics can be an interesting thing to explore in some cases. Yeah. I know a lot of people sort of hate it, but um, I think it's I think it's interesting. Well, I mean, I will say that I was referring to the Kirk uh, Spock era, but look, I'm more biased. I think once we got to the next gen, the aliens did become more full-fleshed and more cultural and more interesting. And maybe I'm just biased, but come on, John Luke, dude. Well, I also think that Star Trek, the original Star Trek, got more interesting when um, some of the science fiction writers uh, started writing some of the alien plots. So um, you got uh, a mock time with uh, Spock mm -hmm. uh, and the Pon Far and the seven year of uh, uh, mating. Uh, mm -hmm. And you started to get some, some exposure to a completely different Vulcan culture that sort of explains their, their nature. Um, and that was that added a lot of dimension, I think, to, to Star Trek, and also things like the Horta, which was the, um, the from the episode "The Devil in the Dark," which was yeah. the um, great episode. Love that episode. Which was the alien that basically tunneled through through rock um, and was the last of her species, laying a, a, trying to lay a clutch of eggs mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything. Um, those things, to me, really, you know. One of my favorite. When Trek started doing aliens properly, and one of my favorite of the show. One of my favorite depictions of aliens was in *The Left Hand of Darkness* um, by uh, Help Me Out, Ursula Le Guin. Ursula Le Guin, thank you. Um, which played a lot with the human theme of gender, uh, and just really blew my mind uh, with her her creatures or her her characters. Uh, were genderless until it was time to reproduce uh, mm -hmm. and what sort of 
cultural, so, uh, soci socio relational, um, emotional implications this had. Uh, she did a great job of not conforming to human human emotions and how a human would, would look at things and really stayed loyal to how her characters would, would look and, and deal with things and realize themselves and have identities. Um, so I, I just I, I just recommend that book if you're interested in exploring uh, aliens uh, with a, a bit of a deviation from the human perspective. See, if you're writing non-human characters, you have the opportunity to really go out into left field uh, oh, yeah. issues like that. Well, remember the binomes. The binomes were like a third gender on that species. It's like you had the male and the female, and they both uh, gave their gay mates into the binome, and the binome was the carrier. You know, they, you can be very creative with uh, what you do with your uh, species. I, I do know that, um, oh, th and this is maybe a little bit of a random topic, but it, it is related. Um, that zoologists and people who are environmentalists and study animals, I know a lot of them because I'm a Virginia master naturalist and I took some zoology classes. They are, they actually are uh, annoyed when storytellers personify animals or, you know, when, when people are dealing with animals and handling animals and give them a name and give them, you know, human emotions and human inter interactions. They actually find it disrespectful uh, to the animal. And uh, I don't know if I agree with that, but it always kind of stuck with me, you know, when my professors would encourage me against, you know, giving a cute name to this, the species that we're studying um, and, and trying to impose human uh, expectations on it. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah. I think what bothers me sometimes is um, you, you get the, the, big, uh, the, the, the big common animals uh, used as the basis for aliens. So you get cat aliens and dog aliens and spider aliens and stuff like that. Right. But if you just looked around at Earth, there are so many different types of creatures with so many different biological patterns. Mm -hmm. it, it, it irks me sometimes that the, the, uh, the biological variety of aliens in SF novels is far less than actually the biological diversity on Earth. Earth has some amazing, amazing, I mean, I mentioned uh, the octopus. The octopus has got its brains and its legs. It's got a distributed neural system that puts so much of its brain energy but in it. But they don't have opposable thumbs. And yet they don't have opposable thumbs, but they have- How are they gonna they build on jars? Sorry, Marty, what is that? Without opposable thumbs, it's more difficult to build spaceships. Well, I would I would disagree there. I mean, they, they can literally take a jar and screw it in and. And they go to the jar and say, hey, hey, I'm sneaky in the jar. Octopus, the, the octopuses, they are very intelligent species. And I wouldn't put it past them. The only problem they have is they kind of have to live in water. <laughs> but well, if they ever and, leave, yeah. learn to live without water. <laughs> and there's, there is an idea in science fiction sometimes that uh, uh, a, a truly aquatic species will never develop, uh, possibly never develop, uh, certainly technology and go to the stars. Probably. But it would have a sense of 3D. Um, Sorry. A lot of technology depends on heat. Uh, being um, able to forge steel requires heat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so imagine that you would have to build spacesuits in order to come out on land and, 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 and live in order to build fires. Well, it's easier to build the fire first and then figure out how to build uh, all these yeah, other things. I agree with you. Uh, if you there, are, there, are all, there are volcanic vents on the sea floor that maybe they could work with. But I mean, you could imagine an octopus. Cold way. Yeah. Yep. You you could imagine an octopus like a like a snail. A snail obviously is a mollusk that learned how to live on land. An octopus could probably learn to live on land, given a few mil million years. And we're talking science fiction now, but give him a few hundred million years, and maybe he is going to have these little squid billies that are going around. Uh, uh, you know, not like the squid billies on the Cartoon Network. Please trust me. <laughs> but uh, you know, going around and spinning in trees and and building rocket ships. Well, I, I think the next candidate for a technological species on, on Earth, if, if humans were gone, it would be gorillas. Apparently there's archeological evidence now that gorillas uh, historically have actually used tools. So or chimpanzees, right? Was it, or was it chimpanzees? I, I think can't it's remember. chimpanzees, they're more yeah. close to. They're close so, to. So they're basically poised to make the jump. It's, it's just that there's a competing species in the way. 
Um, I, will, I will say this, which now that you bring up chimpanzees and bonobos, this is a very fascinating thing because chimpanzees and bonobos are very similar species. They're not exactly the same, they say, because they are in, in different areas and the, the males are a little bit smaller and all that. Um, but, you know, one has taken this very brutal warlike position with their other uh, co-species, you know, territorial and all that. And another has taken a very, and a very, and I also point out patriarchal society, whereas the other has taken a matriarchal society and says that make love, not war, almost literally, <laughs> you know, that, that their, their fornication is pretty much a hello for the bonobo. Uh, and, and that in itself, and I think that goes down to more basic point of what uh, that you just made, David, and I would make the same that watch animals because there are so many ways that animals behave that could give you inspiration for how an alien species might behave. And you guys watch Umbrella Academy? I've seen a little bit of it. I haven't uh, delved into it yet. It's really interesting. One of the characters in that actually is a, uh, um, a chimpanzee that is a very polite British butler. <laughs> Oh yeah, I remember. And the character development in that character is excellent because you know he's got a, a huge backstory on how uh, he got there, and um, and the, the way he interacts with everyone and uh, the plot develops around around that character is just really good. If you will say this, one thing that uh, I I can imagine aliens doing that chimpanzees do. They're angry at you, they'll fling their poop. Yes, but I'd rather not be writing that scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In a world where you can write anything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Anything one. else. Right. World. We'll let Jeffrey write that one. That's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, any final thoughts on writing non human characters? Well, we didn't cover AI much, my friend. Oh, yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that. I write a lot of uh, AI into all my books. And in fact, pretty much every one of my science fiction novels I publish has uh, very well developed, uh, you know, full 3D AI characters. In fact, uh, the book I'm writing now, um, uh, as its central theme, has a AI character in it as well. And um, it's very interesting for me to write those because. Uh, these AI characters, uh, if you can imagine someone with all the intelligence of a human being, but sensor capabilities that vastly outweigh that of a, a human being, like an AI that runs an entire space station, and every sensor on the entire space station that examines space around it, every camera that um, provide security internally, every sensor on every airlock and every uh, temperature gauge everywhere. All of that is sensory input for these AIs and goes into their character development. And I find that to be very, very interesting. Oh, and, yeah. um, uh, but I, I, I will say that, that AIs are an interesting topic insofar as our mo modern society because we know what computers can and cannot do very well. We humans see much better than a computer and we hear much better than a computer, but a computer can do maths much, much better than we can. Well, I think you're talking about the current state of the art, but it doesn't but, have to remain yeah. the way it is. Oh, absolutely. No, it, and it will. Neural networks are getting much better at seeing and hearing. I mean, we are getting to that point. You're absolutely right. Uh, but they will always have at their core what Marty said, which is to be able to organize everything, uh, you know, being able to multitask and all of that. But I think there's other aspects. If, if an AI has a personality, some other aspects are uh, you and I, we have to worry about dying, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have backups. Mm -hmm. We don't have, we're not distributed. Oh, sorry, I lost my A node, but I, I have my other 26 nodes left. Mm -hmm. And all I've, all I've lost is a little bit of memory. Mm -hmm. So not having to worry about dying um, yeah. is, a, is a big difference. Being able to carry on 13,000 conversations at the same time with different people mm -hmm. is very different from a personality perspective. And, and also, 
what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be when you grow up? What does that question mean if you're an AI? It gives you satisfaction if you're an AI. Yeah, I would say the main themes with AI characters is uh, are uh, creationism, consautiousness, purpose, and identity. Yeah. Well, have I you guys read yeah. any of the Bobbleverse uh, novels? I have. I love those. <laughs> and uh, speaking to Shay's point, um, in the Bobbleverse, it's like you know, there's this guy Bob. He was the first AI. And they send them off into outer space to prepare, you know, for human habitation out there. Well, the thing is, all this other crap happens. And Bob decides, look, I need help. I'm going to spawn off another Bob. <laughs> so, you know, suddenly there's a whole bunch of Bobs. It's pretty interesting because the Bobs differentiate in those novels. Mm -hmm. And I find that very engaging when... They have a very common background, and once the AIs go in divergent paths, suddenly this guy has had a really tough time and suddenly has PTSD, and he's like really, you know, not enjoying being being Bob. It's really a very engaging story and very well written, non human characters. Fascinating, because you know it's it's sort of like we humans we have DNA and we have our life experiences we have nature and nurture the computers the bobs they have their equivalent their dna their knowledge everything like that but everything that happens to them influences them and and becoming a different bob they also don't have they don't have parents or if they have they may have influencers but they're not quite parents there's not a built-in bond right they don't necessarily have the same instincts and drives Right, they they may not have any uh, uh, procreation urge or desire to have children, or what would that even mean for them, et cetera, et cetera. So they're they're emphatically not human, without some of the constraints that humans have. That's right. Without the imperatives that people have, mm -hmm. you know, we want to we want food, we want shelter, we want <laughs> companionship, we yeah. want you know to get laid every now and then. And mm -hmm. uh, take all that out, and then uh, suddenly the priorities completely change for an AI. But I want you guys to consider how uh, powerful and how much this captivated uh, people all over the world when the Mars rover sent its final message. Oh, uh, yeah. Its final words, I have to pull it up, were its final message back to NASA. My battery is low, and it's getting dark. Yeah. That sentence just, it just captivated an entire people mm -hmm. uh, so even when, I, when i first read that i got goosebumps literally yeah, yeah. Because the darn thing was up there for like 10 years 15 years so consider that when you're writing ai you know maybe maybe the mars rover really wasn't feeling anything but it still made us feel one other thing though i think we should bring up with ai is that it does evolve and it does get better and better with every year as david just said there is a time when we will have AI that's nearly our intelligence, and there will be a time when the AI is pretty much our intelligence, and then there will be a time when the AI is well beyond our intelligence. And many of the science fiction tropes, as we talked about in the previous episode, although maybe not this particular topic, is when they get to way above our human knowledge, are they going to consider us expendable? Well, now, well you're talking about the similarity, which I, I think is another whole topic. Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole different thing, and so many stories have been written exactly. to that capacity. Exactly, you know, it, is it is a trope. Terminator, you know, it cyberdyne is. systems. The Matrix, um, yeah, it's a trope. But all you authors have really messed me up psychologically. <laughs> I, if, in many ways, but in one way, think of non-human characters. I have a hard time, you know, throwing away like a, a dirty, chewed up stuffed animal because I think, oh, it has feelings and it's going to be sad, you know, if I get rid of it. So I keep it. And I, I'm, I become kind of a hoarder because of that. Authors have really instilled emotions and personalities into a lot of different things that are not human. Mm. Well, I don't know. I, I try to declutter. All right. Now you can do final thoughts, Marty. We're, we're, right. we're going to allow you. <laughs> Last night, that was, uh, thanks, guys. Another great episode. Um, Oh, can I just add, uh, if you guys are, I'm going to start shameless plug, 
if you're interested in non-human characters, I do have a book coming out this year. Uh, that the working title is Overboard, and it has a lot of non-human characters, such as uh, a medical doctor that's a vending machine, uh, a, uh, a villain that's a hermit crab, and a sentient crocodile that falls in love with a human. So if you're interested in that, please look out for it. Okay. <laughs> Once again, another good episode. Can't top that. <laughs> None of us are going to top that. Yeah. We'll see you next time. All right, another finally structured episode, guys. Yeah.